Those food scientists ban are working for organizations that are feeding shareholders and their greatest mandate yeah. is to make sure as you know, cheap as possible, with as much profit as possible, as as addictive as possible, as, you know, with all the different tastes. I mean, we had food scientists on, Joan Ifland on, in terms of the addiction model that was taken from the 85, 86, 87, the biggest tobacco companies buying those exactly. different food companies. So I, I think it's a lot more malicious than that. And I, I don't think they're looking at saying, hang on, how are we going to actually help the, the, the population in terms of our yeah, obesity yeah. epidemic? Commodities wise, right? They're thinking, how can I get the most of that commodity and then make the most money off of that commodity? Mm -hmm. And what are all the different things that I can do? And so the the question is, is how do you how do you uh, force change to you got it like a system that developed in the 60s and 70s and has these kind of grandfathered in laws, especially in the United States, where you uh, have entire organizations that are able to submit things to this uh, generally recognized as safe food status uh, without a whole lot of oversight and regulation. So an organization that I like to bring up, if you wanted to like, you know, I don't, I don't want to vilify anybody, but to uh, look at, at the way they're approving things um, is this organization in the United States called FEMA, this is not the FEMA Emergency Management Company, but the Flavors and Extractives Manufacturing Association. So Flavors and Extractives Manufacturing has been around, like you say, since the 60s and 70s. It had a lot of work in the tobacco space as well. Uh, they basically say that if I approve an extractive, like I make licorice extract or cocoa extract for chocolate flavor, I don't. nobody needs to check it. It's a food ingredient listed as a flavors and extractives manufacturing association approved product. So it's a manufacturer's association. The companies that make it have their own association, no regulation or oversight by any central party. And they can then submit their own generally recognized as safe product into the food pipeline uh, and just be like, hey, this is uh, approved by us. And so that is a... So what you have to do in processed food, in my opinion, is start looking at the areas where there's the exceptions, right? So there's an ingredient on the back of every product you see that says natural and artificial flavors. What are they hiding in that, right? There's a exception in the rules for toothpaste and dental products, and they use the word flavor. That's the approved word that FEMA has allowed. Uh, what is in that flavor category? What are all the things that are approved to be put in that flavor? How many thousands of ingredients can you stick in flavor? And then my favorite is I looked at these, I don't know if they've made them there in South Africa, but native uh, shampoo and conditioner, where they say 10 ingredients only. You can trust us. There's only 10 ingredients in this shampoo and conditioner, except there's a ingredient called fragrance. Yeah. So yeah. in cosmetics, be suspicious of the ingredient label fragrance. How many things can they put into that fragrance category? They're saying that they don't want to tell you what it is because that's a proprietary trademark of their product. They don't want people to be able to reverse engineer their precious product. Uh, but really, they're hiding everything that they don't want to tell you is in the product in that ingredient. And so that's that's, that's the deceptiveness that I see in industry.